Splatoon's main draw is its multiplayer, but I have always been a huge fan of its fantastic, rather overlooked single player modes. The campaigns for all three games are great, particularly Splatoon 3's I Love Salmon Run, as well as the excellent Octo expansion for Splatoon 2. And now we are getting Side Order, a new expansion for Splatoon 3 that takes the core fundamentals and applies it to a roguelite. Which is apparently just the hot new thing everyone is doing right now, with games like Hitman, God of War, and Last of Us Part 2 getting the same treatment. I got to spend a little over an hour hands-on with it, and surprise, surprise, it's pretty good. Side Order is a sequel of sorts to Splatoon 2's Octo Expansion. You play as Agent 8, the returning Octoling protagonist, and this time you find yourself trapped in an unknown digital space along with the pop princess icon Pearl, who is now a cute flying robot drone. You enter the ominous tower in front of you and are tasked with traversing up its 30 floors. Each floor is a random challenge, with bosses on the 10th floor, and death taking you all the way back to the start. So you know, a roguelite. The first thing that stood out about Side Order to me is its really striking look that immediately separates it from the rest of Splatoon. Everything is this colorless, off-white, which oddly reminds me a lot of the later areas in Near Automata. It's one of my favorite visual interpretations of a digital space, and it works beautifully here in Splatoon since you get to paint it with this gorgeous, sparkling pearlescent ink. Splatoon has always had an excellent aesthetic, and Side Order is no exception. The floors themselves are small arenas that have objectives like securing and holding zones, destroying portals that enemies spawn out of, or pushing an orb to a designated point. They feel like bite-sized objectives, mixed with the wave-based nature of Salmon Run, where enemies flank you on all sides while you complete your objectives. It's frenetic and fast-moving, and if you aren't on top of crowd control, things can get overwhelming quick. Some of the challenges can really get your heart racing, but they never outstay your welcome. Most early floors can be completed in around 30 seconds to a minute, which really keeps things moving. You also get a lot of choice when it comes to how you want to tackle the tower. Before you go to the next floor, you get to pick from three different options, which not only vary in room layout and objective type, but also difficulty. The rewards are also different, which feeds into Side Order's take on player bills, color palettes. At the start of your run, you are given a blank color palette, which you will then fill with colored chips. These chips are how you build out your Agent 8, offering passive and active bonuses. There are chips that enhance your weapon, mobility, and even your pearl drone. You get to see which chips are rewarded when picking which floor you like, so while you could always just pick the easy difficulty, instead I would focus on what color chip I would receive and take a potential risk for a big reward. I chose to focus on chips that would keep my ink from running out as quickly, since that's always a major balancing act in Splatoon, and having more ink is always better. I'd then get chips that up to the damage enemies could take while swimming in my ink. So now I have more ink to throw on the ground, and I could take out enemies without having to directly touch them. It was a simple combo, but it already got the gears turning in my head about potential builds. Chips are color-coded based on what they do, so it's easy to build out, and it's fun to see how the different chips stack on each other and play with your chosen weapon. For example, a member of the Nintendo Treehouse showed us a Floor 16 build using the Charger, Splatoon's version of the Sniper Rifle, that requires you to charge it for more powerful shots. He built his palette in a way where the charge was almost instantaneous, letting him fire off this high-powered rifle like it was an automatic shotgun. It looked completely broken, in a deliberate OP kind of way, and that's the sort of creativity and tinkering that I want to mess around more with. Personally, I was able to make my way all the way up to floor 16 on my first run. Not bad considering that's halfway through. Some floors can be really easy going, like how I was able to one-shot an orb from the start right into the goal, pretty proud of that one, but other times the challenge really can sneak up on you. I took a gamble on the hardest difficulty because I wanted a particular color chip, and I paid the price by getting overwhelmed almost instantly by a huge mob of enemies. A perfect run can fall apart in seconds in that classic roguelite fashion that is so frustrating, but also makes you say, alright, just, just one more run. They also mix in other elements like danger rooms. These add in extra challenges, like turning off the lights for low visibility, or not letting you move around while in your squid form. Of course, you could simply 
not pick the danger room, but if you ignore it for too long, eventually all of your choices will become danger rooms, leaving you no choice but to squid up and face the music. This is a really clever way of forcing a little stress on the player and keeping them on their toes. Now once you do die, your total point score is converted into currency you can spend on permanent upgrades. These are things like adding more lives per run, reducing damage, etc. With more of these upgrades becoming available as you play, so there is a lot to unlock. Now one of the most important aspects of Splatoon is your weapon of choice, because they do all handle quite differently. In side order, you do start with a few basics with the ability to unlock new weapons over time. What's interesting is that they do try and encourage weapon swapping by offering keys. Each weapon can earn three keys in the tower. Once you've found all three keys, you can't earn any more with that weapon, so you'll then need to switch to a new weapon if you want to keep earning keys. The keys themselves are used to open lockers at the base of the tower for helpful items. I like that it encouraged me to not just stick with the good old splatter shot the whole time, but there are some weapons in Splatoon I just do not enjoy using or don't find as useful. We'll see how this works out in the final version, but I can't anticipate feeling frustrated needing to use some weapons I don't really prefer just to earn some keys. Maybe this is where some of the color-coded chip customization can alleviate that strain, like making a sniper rifle shoot at the rate of a shotgun, for example. We'll see. And that leads to the big question surrounding any roguelite. While the foundation is all here, and I had a really great time with my first run, it's hard to say how side order will hold up after hours of play and dozens of runs. That's not something we can really know until we get our hands on with the full experience, and I am looking forward to seeing how this plays several hours in. But overall, I came away from my time really excited for Side Order. A roguelite take on Splatoon ended up feeling so natural that I'm kind of surprised it wasn't already a thing, because the pieces have always been there. You got the variety of weapons Splatoon is known for, the enemy variety and horde-like nature that comes from Salmon Run, and it's all mixed with this very compelling progression system. If you're someone that loves Splatoon but eventually fell off the multiplayer for other games, Side Order might just be the perfect way to jump back in. I'm excited to see how the final version stacks up when it releases in only a few weeks on February 22nd.